sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? This next song we're going to do goes right along with my opening prayer this morning, and it's a song that uh, is an original. The pain you must have felt Well, dying on the cross for me The pain you must have felt Father could not see the pain he must have felt hanging on Calvary. The cross that held his body, it holds my soul too. The love that Jesus showed me on the walk that I went through the pain he must have felt dying on the cross for me the pain he must have felt hanging on Calvary but the love Walking up to Calvary, the love he must have felt nailed upon that tree. The love he must have felt bleeding for you and me. The love. Dying on Calvary, the cross that held his body, it holds my soul too. The love that Jesus showed me on the 
the pain he must have felt hanging on Calvary. You may all sit, please. He came to do, to die, to be buried, and praise God on the third day be risen from the dead by the Father, to live forevermore and give us that hope, that sense of purpose, and that joy that we can experience as his people. Praise God, we can know that here at Bethel Covenant Church. So welcome to each and every one of you here in person and online as well. It's good to be together and worship the Lord. It is Holy Week this week, Palm Sunday leading into Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and then, of course, our Easter celebration. One thing we're going to do this week is we will have a Good Friday service at 6.30 if you're able to be here. And one of the things we're going to do is as you leave church today, we have nails, kind of old carpenter nails, old nails, symbolizing what Jesus experienced on that cross for us. And so I'm going to have these for you when you leave to carry around with you this week. In this Holy Week, just to continue on a regular basis, be thinking of what Jesus did, his love, his sacrifice for you and me on the cross. And this nail is kind of representative of that. So I'm going to ask you to carry it in your pocket, in your purse, in your wallet, whatever works, to keep in forefront of your mind this week, this Holy Week, as we think of what Jesus came to do for you and me. And then on Good Friday, if you're able to come, come back with that, and then we'll lay these, nail these at the cross as part of the Good Friday service knowing that we've transferred our sin to Jesus so that we who have fallen short, praise God, are forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done when we put our faith and trust in him. And so they'll be part of the service, sharing the Lord's Supper as well on Good Friday. So 6.30 on Friday if you're able to join us. But that's something we'll do this week to encourage us as the church to really be mindful of what Jesus has done for us. And then, of course, next Sunday we'll gather for our 10 a.m. Easter celebration, the highlight of the year, celebrating Jesus' resurrection. So a couple of exciting things for the church going on here in these next in this next week. Um, time for prayers for the church. We have some listed here. Do we have other prayer requests that we would would be available? People would list? Is, is Ivy available? Maybe she can help me out. Ivy, can you help me out with the microphone? You guys are so good at that. We've got one over here with Linda. I would appreciate prayers on Wednesday. I'm going to have my first eye fixed with the cataract. Just a huge thank you for everybody who helped out this morning. God and my family knows I do not belong in the kitchen, and it, he provided abundantly for everybody down there, so I cannot say thank you enough. He even knew I was stressing about how to get into the church this morning, and he left me keys. So it doesn't get better than that. So thank you. I can second that she doesn't belong in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask prayers for my wife, Sherry. She fell uh, last weekend, got a concussion, and is avoiding loud noises and bright lights. Uh, the doctor says she should, you know, take some month or so to heal, but just lift up, up in prayers. Also, we got a uh, text message from Leanne Peterson, who's in Poland, uh, and she has some, they've been searching for uh, housing for all the ladies 
of their church, and she's been, uh, the God has blessed them with places for um, like a, a dozen groups of ladies uh, and children who have evacuated Ukraine and are in Poland, and she just praises the Lord for the way that he worked mm -hmm. to bring um, bring this about and continue to pray uh, uh, you know, for them. Uh, their city is in uh, harm's way, um, but uh, she was able to go there and connect with uh, many of the people from her church. Anything else? We have a praise and also asking for prayer for our son-in-law. Some of you probably know him, Matt Foley. Friday, he had five-way bypass surgery. Oh, my. Um, they knew it was going to be four-way, but when they got in there, there was an extra blockage they didn't know about. So instead of a four-hour surgery, it turned out to be six hours. He's doing okay. I talked to Linda yesterday, and she said, he's doing okay, and he's ornery today. So, <laughs> so that's probably a good sign. But he's going to need prayer because, for one, he's a type A personality, and he's going to take a long recovery for him. Mm -hmm. So continue to remember him in prayers. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a great breakfast this morning. We appreciate everyone who worked on that. Thanks for that. And I'm going to have to work, work hard to make sure people don't fall asleep after those full tummies when we're preaching. So, But let's uh, go to the Lord together in prayer. Oh, Lord God, we come before you. And Lord, we approach you as you instruct us boldly in Jesus' name. Because you've opened up the doors. You've ripped that, that curtain in two so we can have access to you, the God of heaven the God of eternity, and we thank you that we can go straight to you through Jesus Christ and bring our praises, Lord, our requests, concerns before you. Lord, we praise you that you are God. You are sovereign over the world and over this earth. Lord, even in, in spite of the things that are taking place in our world, we know that, Father, you are in control. We pray for wisdom, for our leadership and leaders of the free world continue to combat what's taking place in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for the frustration, restraint of Russia and their aggression. Pray for the protection and the peace of Ukraine. And Lord, we ask that you would, Lord, continue to use Leanne as she's working with those refugees who come from her church in Ukraine for the housing. Lord, we praise you and we ask that you would continue to work to, for the protection of, of these. And may Lord, they be, continue to be an instrument of, of your truth, of your good news in these challenging days and times. Lord, be with the, the church, especially, we ask in the name of Christ. Lord, we pray for, uh, continue to pray for Tisha's mom, uh, family as her mom passed away here last week. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them, you would encourage them, you would give them. Lord, not only good memories of mom, but, but also the, Lord, the hope that we have in Christ, that everyone who knows you, Lord, we have hope in the future. So be with Tisha and her family in these, these challenging days, Father. Lord, we pray for Rose Crabtree's mother as she's been falling. We ask, Lord, for protection and wisdom, how to deal with this. Lord, be close to the family and give her the strength that she needs. For Gail, as she has upcoming eye surgery, Lord, we pray for your protection and help to her, as we pray for Linda as well, as she has eye surgery cataracts on Wednesday. Lord, we pray that the surgery go well. Lord, protect, protect their eyes and bring healing through the, the surgery that's taking place. Lord, we thank you for the provisions and the things that you do, Lord, as Krista says. Lord, thank you how you provide. Lord, you provide what we need in your way, in your timing, Lord. Help us to continue to trust you, Lord. Where there are needs for jobs, where there are needs for relational fractures and healing, Lord, we pray for that. Lord, bring these things before you for your healing and your work. And we give you thanks that you care for us. 
Lord, we pray for Alan Milley's son-in-law as, as he's uh, had this bypass surgery. We pray for his healing, his recovery. Give him the patience and the, the strength he needs. Lord, recover for this. And we, Lord, we thank you that he went, came through it well. So, Father, we pray for that. And we pray also for Sherry Johnson as, as Lord, she fell and had this concussion. Lord, we ask that you would bring the healing and recovery to her and that you would help her to slow down and, and take it easy for the time that she needs to heal so, Lord, she, her brain can heal and be restored. So, Father, protect her, give John patience and wisdom, how he can best encourage and help Sherry as well. So, Father, we lift her up before you. For other needs that exist, things in our heart, Lord, where we praise you, Lord, we celebrate and we give you thanks. Where we have concerns and needs, Lord, we bring them before you as well. Lord, things unspoken, you know what they are. Lord, answer those in accordance with your will and give us strength to trust you. So, Father, we trust in your insight and your unfailing love. Lord, we thank you that we can bring these before you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things through Christ. Amen. Please, everybody, stand and let's worship our Lord with music again. Your only Son, no sin to hide, but have sent Him. To walk upon this guilty sun and to become the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the holy Lamb. Jesus Christ. 
Precious Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, thank you, John and worship team. As we do from week to week, we remind us part of our worship is giving unto the Lord. You know, in, in worship, we offer to the Lord our, our praises through our words, our songs. We offer, also offer our, our offerings, our gifts, and a portion of what God has given to us. So we give unto the Lord. You know, we can give through sending a check, putting an offering in the box out, giving online, electronically, however we do it. But that's part of our worshiping the Lord, is the offering a portion of what the Lord has given to us unto him. Thank you for giving. Children can be dismissed for children's church, and they're asked to bring their coats. Kids, bring your coats. And maybe something to that, so you never know. So make sure you bring them with. <laughs> We continue on in our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 11 today as we're working through the section on the resurrection of Christ on this Palm Sunday. And I'm going to read verse 5 through 11 at this point in, in time. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 5. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. And this is what you believed about the resurrection of Christ. Let's, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word, your truth revealed to us, incarnated in Christ and inscripturated in your word. Help us, Lord, to receive and be open to your word so that Lord, we can be challenged, encouraged, and built up by your truth so that we can live lives pleasing to you because Jesus Christ died and rose again to live forevermore. We ask this and pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You know, Africa is a huge continent. Do you know how much bigger Africa is than the continental United States? Anyone know? Three times. Think about that. The continental United States, if you drive from San Francisco to Miami or Seattle to Miami, that's a long drive. But think of Africa. It's three times greater, bigger than that. And in the 1800s, Africa being huge, but to Western Europe and the United States, it was pretty much unknown. And there was a young man, David Livingstone. He was from Scotland. He was a medical doctor, and he was commissioned as a missionary by the church in Scotland as well, and he traveled to Africa to, with the hope of opening up Africa so that the church, the good news of Jesus Christ, could be made known to the people who lived there. And one of the ways he did, did that was through exploration, he would go and explore new areas and create inroads where there'd be connection between the church and with these new areas in Africa. And one time, he had done many trips, but he wanted to go into the, the middle, the deepest part of Africa, where no one from the West had ever gone before. And he wanted to open up that interior Africa, so he said civilization, commerce, and Christianity would help the people who lived there. And so he, in his exploration work, he did over 25 years, that was his, his work. And his discoveries of rivers, peoples, and waterfalls, and his report back to Europe in the United States as well, made him a famous explorer, which many people knew. I mean, this was exploratory into a new parts of the world that people didn't know. So in the newspapers of the day, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have uh, Facebook and uh, Snapchat and Instagram back then, so you had to get your information through the newspaper. And so if you get in the newspaper, and we would learn, the people would learn much about this. New rivers, peoples, waterfalls. And so he became famous in the Western world, opening up parts of Africa. 
And after he'd done this for 25 years, he still hadn't gone into the depths of the interior of Africa because it was so foreboding to get there. But he wanted to get there. And so he, in, 19, in 1866, he wanted to take a long journey into the core, into the middle of Africa to open this up as well. And he took his party, and this was well documented, and the newspaper celebrated, so he took off. But you know what? After a time, and when I say time, not months, but a year, two years, three years, guess what? He hadn't been heard from. And so in 1869, people were concerned. What happened to Livingston? Is Livingston alive? Maybe he's dead. Maybe he met a, a terrible fate or sickness overtook him. People didn't know. But in New York City, a newspaper publisher of the New York Herald commissioned um, Stanley, Henry Stanley, to go and see if he could find Livingstone. Because he wanted to know, James Gordon Bennett, who ran the New York Herald, sent Henry Stanley into Africa to seek out Livingstone and to write articles about his journey along the way. So Stanley went and headed out, and over the next two years, he searched for Livingstone, writing articles. And it became a huge thing on both sides of the Atlantic, thinking Livingstone was gone. But what happened is, as Henry Stanley was seeking out, after two years, he got to a village where he heard that Livingstone was close by. And finally, he, he found the village where Livingstone was in Africa. And he said, Livings, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, maybe you've heard those famous words. That's how he greeted. You know, you find another uh, white gentleman in Africa back that day. It's probably who he was. And so he presumed, and that was after five years. Livingstone had not been heard of by the Western public for five years. And many people in the Western world thought he was dead, gone. He was, he was, there's no way that Stanley would find him alive. But here he was, found alive and healthy, although he was suffering some, some maladies that would come without modern medicine and so forth. But he was thought to be dead, gone, disappeared. But what he was, he's alive. And Dr. Livingstone's appearance was incredible to people on both sides of the Atlantic. Well, it was an incredible find. You know, he's alive, Livingstone's alive. But you know what? There was an even greater find, and that was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reality of Jesus' resurrection, his appearance, that appearance of Jesus who was dead, and not just missing, but still alive, but someone who was put to death by the Romans on the cross. Thought, thought by many to be done, this is it, we'll never hear him again. But on the third day, God brought him back from the dead, firstborn from the dead. And Paul here in this section is revealing to us the importance of Jesus alive for us to instruct us about the reality of the resurrection and how this changes you and it changes me. And on this Palm Sunday, as the kids were marching, waving the palms, we think about 2,000 years ago, and that took place in Jerusalem. Jesus entered Jerusalem with his eyes fixed on the cross to die, to, set, to save us from our sins, to pay the price for us. But praise God, not to stay in the grave, but to be risen from the dead, to live forevermore. And with Jesus on that, Paul wants us to capture, to understand the glories of what Jesus has done for you and me. Is this not a wonderful truth, a powerful Im impact into our world that we need in our troubled, war-filled, and challenged world today? Well, let's consider a couple thoughts from these verses here in 5 through 11 of 1 Corinthians 15. On this Palm Sunday, as we celebrate Jesus, the King who entered in the world, and that humble donkey entered to die and rise for us. But in this, his Jesus' resurrection, what Jesus came to do to die and come back to life, this was a show-stopping appearance, what Jesus did for us. This was no ordinary appearance, but this was really a show-stopping appearance, we could say. For what I received, I passed to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and they appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. As we looked at last week, this of first importance. But this appearance of Jesus is, we could say, a show-stopping performance of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. 
Now, this idea of show-stopping is used of many things. Primarily, and first, first up, it's used of in performance. If you're doing a musical or a, a live play, why do they call it show-stopping? Because people are amazed at what's taking place, and they clap, they applause, and it goes on long enough where the performers have to stop to let the applause die down. So that's the idea of a show-stopping. It doesn't happen real frequently, but when it happens, it's something incredible. You, maybe you've heard the term of show-stopping performance or show-stopping dinner or creation of some sort. It, stands, it means it stands above all others. It's something to be remembered, talk about, compared to something which is just merely good or well done. At the Grammys in 2014, they said Adele and Beyonce did a show-stopping performance in their singing, according to a New York Times reviewer. What Paul is saying to us is what Jesus did was a show-stopping appearance. For he rose from the dead. This was no ordinary act. This was the work of God. It wasn't one of many. But Jesus had a lot of different performances. This was just one. It wasn't just, he was a great prophet who came and talked and dwelt among us. Jesus wasn't merely in the line of sages or teachers or mystics, really a, a fine teacher. Jesus came as the one and only Son of God, Come to, came to do what only he could do that had never been done by anyone or never since. And into our world, God takes on human form. Jesus becomes human like you and me, this infinite God-man, entering our world for our redemption. Having taken on flesh, he lives, teaches us, and takes upon us what we couldn't do. He takes upon himself our sin, your sins and mine, going to the cross. And that's where at the cross, with those nails that we'll be carrying, it will be driven into his hands and his feet, Jesus received the punishment of a sinner, even though he was without sin. The punishment of sin for us. Jesus took it upon himself so that we could be reconciled with God. This is of first importance what Paul says Jesus Christ has done for you and me. He died for our sins. He was buried, raised on the third day, all according to the scriptures. What the scriptures have said in the Old Testament and here recorded what he had done in the New Testament. But we could say in the show-stopping part is at the very end. Because people have died, and many may not recognize the, the quality and what Christ has done in taking our sin. But what happens when he was raised on the third day? That's the show-stopping performance. Because who has seen that? Who has seen a dead person come back to life? And not just merely dead, but someone who is dead where they cease to live, but then brought back to life and full living life. For Jesus died and rose again for you and me. Not in mere human form like Lazarus. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, brought Lazarus back to life for a time. But Jesus is raised to life, and not just life in this human body, but physically in a glorified body. The bodies that we will receive in heaven. that Bodies that don't decay any longer. Flesh that can eat, but you know what? Flesh that will never decay. Think about that. Those future bodies that Jesus had, that we will have, will never have aches and pains in the morning when you wake up. How about that? Oh, the shoulder, oh, the back. Oh, no, never have that. Stomach ache, troubles, whatever it is, they will never experience that. Physical body that can eat, be touched, but doesn't have the restrictions of the human bodies we have now. No longer subject to sickness, no longer have pain, no mourning or sadness, won't experience hunger or thirst, but can eat and drink. This is what Jesus was raised in, the resurrection body, a physical body, but a glorified body. That, my friends, is the show-stopping appearance to end all others. That's what Jesus did. He took it to a whole new level that God brought him the Son, back to life. The greatest appearance throughout all human history. Jesus, who appeared humbly in his birth, when he came in his incarnation, humbly in Bethlehem, in a cattle stall, the most humbly of, humblest of all births, and yet his death, and praise God, his resurrection, 
is proclaimed for all to see. This isn't God doing a, oh, a nice thing. This is God's work for you and me. Jesus is alive for our hopes, for our dreams, for our future, for our lives. Skeptics deny it. But why? Because dead men don't rise. But God, who is greater than even death, has brought Jesus back from the dead. The God who blasts through all the doubts and denials to deliver us Jesus, who will live forevermore. This was the show-stopping appearance for the ages. And praise God, it is for you and me. This isn't just Jesus doing something out there, but he does something tangible so that our lives can be changed. Our futures can be impacted. The Jesus who entered Jerusalem on that humble donkey now enters the world as the firstborn for the dead, as the firstfruits, so that you and I can have hope and a future in life. This was a show-stopping appearance. Not only show-stopping, but a phenomena proving appearance as well. A phenomena. In other words, a real fact which is extraordinary, amazing, remarkable, not just unusual, but wondrous in its, in its development. Five through eight, Paul says, and then Jesus appeared to Cephas, and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Jesus appears. Jesus appears alive. He was no longer in the grave, but he's alive, and he appears to these various people who knew him in life. And what does it say? He appears to his followers, known people at various times in various places, described in the book of Acts, the story of the beginning of the church. And Paul, as he does, he's recording these in the order to show the leadership of the church, the foundation of the church, Cephas or Peter, the 12, the 500, and then James and Paul, showing the leaders of the church, the, the many who helped establish and go forward, Jesus appeared to them in this way so that the church would be established and go forward based and built on what Christ has done for us. And who does he say first? But he appeared to Peter, to Peter, that leader of the disciples, the chief of the disciples, their leaders, their rock, Peter's name, of course, means rock or Cephas. Even though Peter fell short, as we all do, in the garden as he denied Jesus, surrounded in that, in that day with the, in the courtyard of the high priest, he fell short, he sinned, but God restores him. And he, what does we see? Jesus says, Peter, upon you, I will build my church. Jesus built the church upon these leaders. Exactly what he states in Matthew 18 for the other disciples as well. Peter is the main leader of the church in the book of Acts as the story unfolds to the Jews. And Jesus calls out Peter, Cephas or Peter, as who he appeared to so that we would know that Jesus' resurrection was real. These are eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And it's important to establish this so it's not just this mystical, ethereal thing, but this is real, physical, true resurrection. So he appeared to Peter, and then to the 12. The 12 are, is another name for the 12 disciples. Like there are 12 tribes in the Old Testament, there are 12 apostles or disciples in the New Testament, leaders of the church, followers of Jesus who lived among him for the time. And as we know, 12 becomes a representative number because at this time, there's 11. Judas was the one who betrayed him, who was no longer part of them. And they're representative of the ones who are leading the church. Paul's reference in the office, we could say. But they're all eyewitnesses of Jesus. And they knew him intimately. They lived with him over time, some three years. And it's crucial that Jesus would appear to them. Why? Because they knew who he was. They knew the truth of Jesus. For example, let's say you, you live with your spouse or you have a roommate or whatever and you've been together, you know, sharing the same roof for a number of years. If somebody came in and tried to trick you and pretend they were that person, you would probably know it, don't you think? 
because you've lived with them for these number of years. You've learned not only what they look like, but their habits, their patterns, what they do. They're not going to fool you and say, no, no, I know who you are. Paul uses this understanding so we realize that Jesus truly appeared to the apostles, those who lived with him. This was no fake, this was no shadow, no ghost-like appearance. This is a real physical appearing. They lived with him, they knew who Jesus was. He, there was no fooling them. Jesus appeared to Peter, to the twelve, as the one who had risen from the death, who had defeated death to live eternally. And after that, he appeared, it says, to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, in other words, followers of Christ, those who had gathered to follow Jesus. He appeared to them as a large group in maybe several different appearances. We don't know all the specifics, but it's showing us, and Paul's trying to help us realize, this isn't just, okay, an inside conspiracy of the 12, of, of Peter and, and the 12, we're going to just say that Jesus is alive, but we're not going to let anyone else know, and then we'll just control the information. Now, Jesus appeared to a large group of more than 500. And, it's, and part of that is to prove that Jesus was alive because 500 is important. It's not a small group. This is not a dream or a conspiracy, not a hallucination. This is a real appearing of Jesus who's alive, appearing to many believers, many more people, than it would take to somehow try to hide it or for it not to be real. The Gospels and the book of Acts give more detail. But Paul's summarizing Jesus' resurrection appearing for so many so that we can believe. The real appearing to many people at different times, proving again that Jesus is alive forevermore. Paul, 25 years after the resurrection, writes this book of, to the church in Corinth, and he says, some have fallen asleep, meaning that some have died. Some have died, but most are still alive. In other words, these are eyewitnesses. These are over 500 eyewitnesses. People have seen with their eyes that Jesus was alive, and most of them are still alive. And he uses that metaphor of sleep because in the light of the resurrection of Christ, they aren't dead in an eternal state, but they're alive waiting the resurrection of Christ taking these that Paul's proclaiming Jesus appeared, resurrected, alive to many, to the disciples, to the many, saying that he is alive. Well, then he appeared to James. And who is James? James is Jesus' little brother. And we find in the Gospels that James and Mary and James and the brothers, they didn't believe Jesus initially. They didn't believe, they didn't follow him. Because they're thinking, he's a brother. He can't be the son of God. But Jesus, in his, after his death, in his resurrection, he appears to James, and James is transformed. He sees that Jesus is alive, and he realizes he truly is. Though he's my brother, he is the son of God as well. And James becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. As the 12 disciples and apostles fan out with the good news, James stays close to home in Jerusalem, builds the church from which the entire church was built. A doubter would not be convinced unless there's real reasons. James, who doubted, became convinced because he saw that Jesus truly was risen from the dead. And then it says, then to the apostles, as it goes on the next group after James, is the apostles. And what we mean by that, apostles, those who are eyewitnesses of Jesus, who had been given a commission by the Holy Spirit to go forth and tell others about the good news. Larger than the 12 disciples, but smaller than the 500. Maybe people like we see in the New Testament, like Barnabas and Silas are part of these apostle group. He appeared to them as well. All saying, these are ones who saw and communicated with the resurrected Jesus. And last of all, he says he appeared to me. But in his appearance to Paul, it was different. It was not in the same manner or form as the others. In fact, Paul used is an unusual term to describe his birth. He uses the term that is used in the original language for miscarriage to describe his birth in Christ. It wasn't a full delivery, but he was born in a different way. For what does Paul say here in the text? And last of all, he appeared to me, verse 8, as to one abnormally born. For 
Jesus appeared to Paul, resurrected where? From heaven, in his road to Damascus experience. He saw Jesus alive, and his life was changed. So that we have all these different ways that Jesus appeared to his followers. And that his, Paul's visitation with Jesus was the same resurrected Christ, but in this unique display. All these different things put together show that what Jesus, what God has done through Jesus was nothing short of phenomenal, extraordinary. Nothing else like it has ever been seen. He re- appearing that happened to so many in many different ways, there's no way to describe it anything else than this is a true resurrection, physical resurrection of the Son of God for you and for me. It was phenomenal. Praise be to his name. And as Paul encounters Jesus, a show-stopping appearance, a phenomena-proving appearance. But praise God, it's also a grace-granting appearance. Moreover, it was to Paul, as it is to us, it's grace-granting. It's undeserved. Paul says in the last couple of verses of this text, for I'm the least of the apostles, do not deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. The resurrection to death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life. It's undeserved. Paul plays off his statement of unusual birth, recognizing the true meaning of grace. God's work for us, apart from anything in us inherently worthy of that grace. But by God's grace, he does his work. But by the grace of God. You've heard that term before, but Paul uses that in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. God's grace is what has enabled me to become the leader of the church to the Gentiles. To create the word, word of God in many other languages and people and places. That word which has come to us. It was through the Apostle Paul's work. It got its start and it's come down to us. God's grace is what made him, changed him into what he was. As Paul writes, it's because God's grace through Jesus Christ, through the resurrection that this is built upon. God's grace shapes and forms him into what he is. And so that he says, By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. In other words, that grace of God, that resurrected Christ who showed his grace to me, changed me. It transformed me. It made me into who I am. Remember we said he was Saul, and he became Paul. He was changed. He was totally transformed by the message of grace, by the message of Jesus who died and rose again. Paul is clear, make no mistake about this truth in his life. It isn't Paul's work, his skills, even though he works harder than the rest. It isn't his talent, his inner ability that brings him to the table that made Paul able to accomplish what he did. It isn't his insights and his brain power, even though God used that. It is God's grace in his life. Paul saw his gifts and his skills empowered by the Holy Spirit, useful to build the church because he had seen the resurrected Christ. And that's what enabled him to be effective in the kingdom's work. The grace of God had transformed him. That grace was not without effect, Paul says. Completely based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is the gospel we've been talking about, that good news changing Paul's life, the persecutor who's now the biggest proponent of the gospel message. Grace had a tremendous effect. He was changed. The one who opposed the church now preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the work of God. And as we see this in Paul's life, we realize that this is a life-changing message. It changed Paul. But it's not to stop there. It's to change you and me as well. This life-changing, earth-shattering message. No one else has ever defeated death to open up eternal life but Jesus. The resurrection is of ultimate importance. For without the resurrection, we have no lasting hope. Because there is no possibility of resurrection or of life in the future without the resurrection of Christ for you and me. In this world that's in war, that's in turmoil, that's trying to overcome a viral 
pandemic. He's trying to deal with all that Satan throws against us. Where do we find our hope but in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Paul, Paul declares the reality of the resurrection as the basis for our hope by the grace of God. What effect does that grace have in your life and mine? What is the resurrection of Jesus changing in you? How is it shaping and forming your life? How, what effect has it had on you? Has it made you into the person you are? Is it shaping you into a person who lives to please God? Is it transforming you into the, into the woman or man that God wants you to be? Is it giving you the hope in uncertain time? For the resurrection is proof of God's life-changing power. This is to be personal for us as it was in Paul. That grace which is available and God offers it to you, we must receive and let God's work do it for his glory and our blessing. On this Palm Sunday, as Jesus enters Jerusalem, he enters with his cross on his mind. He does that not for himself, but for you and for me. So that we could be changed and transformed. So that the grace of God could work in your life and mine. He's alive, praise be to his name. He's alive so that we can live in accordance with what God has for us. We can be content even in circumstances that we don't desire. We can speak the truth in love even when lying may make it easier for us to get out of trouble. We can view and handle our money as stewards of what God has given to us, realizing we're not the owners of what we have, but God is ultimately the owner of everything there is. We can use our time that reflects the priorities of God's grace. We can think about other people and what we can do, how we can reach out and help others, especially coming out of days of physical and social isolation. Our work, our efforts, our hobbies, what we spend time and energy and effort in life. Are we self-absorbed or are we Christ-focused, using them to glorify God? All that God has done for us is so that we can be people who are transformed and changed. Is this your experience? Is this my experience? Is that grace of God that worked in Paul the same grace that's working in you? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. For the gospel must change us. That good news has to have its effect. The gospel is there in its power of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's to change and shape us so that we live in the hope of the resurrection. And this Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, are we letting him enter our lives to him to do his grace work of transformation in you and me? That's why we, you know, another reason why we want to hand out our, these nails, to give us this week the chance to think, God, am I allowing your grace which is available, your grace which is powerful, am I allowing that to do its work in me as you did its work in the Apostle Paul. And as I encourage us to think about this over this next week, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. Can we, along with Paul, say that? God's grace to me was not without effect. In other words, God's grace changed me into the image of Christ. Maybe not fully, we're still in process, I certainly am, but it's changing you and me. Is that the truth? Is that the spirit of your life? And as we go to this, I'm going to ask us to take 30 seconds of just quiet reflection to ask God, is your grace, your power in Jesus' death and resurrection, is it changing me? Is it the grace having that effect to hand Paul in my life? If it isn't, let's ask God to let it do that's work in us. Let's just take a few moments of quiet reflection. Lord, here together, we ask that your grace would have its impact on us.
and that it would be transforming and shaping us into that which blesses us and glorifies your name. On this Palm Sunday, may we in this week, Lord, take a journey ever closer to you and your grace-changing work in our lives. We pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Please stand and join us in this last song. Without him, I could do nothing. Oh, Jesus, we need you. We thank you that you entered in Jerusalem for our benefit, for our blessing, and our redemption and salvation. Lord, thank you that you have done this for us. May we receive your grace and let it change us by your Spirit's work in us, we pray. Lord, give us just a tender sensibility to your sacrifice for us this week as we approach the cross on Friday and then celebrate your resurrection on Sunday. Lord, to change and transform us through your grace, we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.